I made a new big board with a new top 10. What does James think of the top 10? Find out next on Locked On NBA Big Board. Welcome into Locked On NBA Big Board. Leaf Tulane here with you along with James Barlow. And this will be an interesting exercise. We haven't talked about it prior. Uh, we did an episode two or three weeks ago that was similar. I made a big board. I have since released my post-combine big board as of last week. And I'm going to say it and see if James agrees with me. And if not, we're going to have a, a civil debate on it. So, uh James and I have been uh, studying film. We watch the combine, the, those type of uh, drills, how much do they factor in. But let's get this going because I have a player at number one that very few have that high, and I think he's more commonly at 10 than in the top three. So my number one is Rob Dillingham, and I know I've told you I like him for a while. Um, I had him too the last time we did this, so it's not too drastic of a leap from, from my personal side, but it's drastic compared to many others. So my rationale – Dillingham's going to score you 20 points in the NBA, and I'm not sure how many other players do that. If you look at all-star potential, which is not too too high in this class, like we talked about that in a different episode for the everydayers tuning in, we appreciate you. I think Dillingham's got a, the Darius Garland effectiveness um, in terms of a a little bit of a watered-down Trey Young skill set, kind of the effectiveness of Darius Garland in his first five years. I don't know if he's a franchise piece. I would I would say he's not. But he's been an all-star, and I think if you're getting an all-star at one who I think has got a little more twitch than Garland, um, I'll take it in this draft. You know what? As one of the uh, card-carrying members of the Rob Dillingham fan club, I'm not going to argue with you. So let me ask you a question, though, slightly off. If somehow, some way, the – they can make trades after the finals. Atlanta's like, you know what? Trey Young will send you somewhere else. DeJounte Murray will send you somewhere else. Are you comfortable with taking Rob Dillingham? Again, I know this is not a mock, but this is a big board. But if all the dominoes fall the way that they could fall, which some people want them to fall, would you take Rob Dillingham number one with your the Atlanta Hawks? Yeah, to answer the question, if Trey Young's not there, I would be fine with it because I deem him to be the best player in this class. He may not have the absolute highest ceiling, but I, like I said, I think he's got just as much potential to be an all-star as anyone else and probably a safer floor to go with it. Um, and I think the, the irony would be that he's similar to Trey Young. He draws that comparison a lot. Like I said, the skill set's similar. I don't think if you boil down their game that they're exactly alike, like Trey Young scored 27 a game as a freshman and you knew how effective he was as a shooter and it was, and it was there, but you just couldn't stop it. Dillingham had his moments. He picked and chose and he was able to be effective at a lot of times. There's some games where he was a bit of a no show, but I think Dillingham's going to improve a lot with NBA spacing. Whereas Trey Young, I think what was what he was and he was a star coming out of Oklahoma and he became a multi-time all-star but maybe not a winning player. So to answer your question, I would pick him. I think there's a little bit of irony involved there of taking a guy that whose comparison is similar to the player that would be leaving. Especially like physically, like they almost have like the carbon copy body frame, just grown men in a, in a small body. All right. So tell me about Alex Saar number two. Well, Alex Saar, I, I think his floor, and this is not typically how I would draft uh, I like to draft potential, and I think you could make the argument, oh, Sar's athletic. He's be tested as a big dude. He showed fluidity as a shooter at the combine, even though he shot 28% from three. So what are you talking about, Leaf? Is there upside? I think he's more of a floor guy. I think he's like Evan Mobley if he's like any player in the NBA, but I don't think he's the prospect Mobley was coming out of USC. And for what it's worth, Mobley's averaging about 16 and eight, and that's a really good basketball player, but that's nowhere near an all-star. Um, and that's in the side of uh, of the conferences with fewer um, talented bigs. Obviously, there's Embiid and Adebayo, but uh, the others, the Western Conference, in terms of measuring all stars, that's a gauntlet, especially with Wembenyama and Chet just entering the NBA. So, if you're looking at, at a draft by measuring all stars or all NBA, and I know some people have those, their tier systems, like a five star is someone who's a all NBA talent, a four is an all star, a three is a role player. 
I think he's closer to a 3.5 than a 4.5. And that's typically not how I like to draft in terms of that. But what he does do well is he's going to protect the basket, have the chance to move up defensively on the perimeter as well and not be uh, only a drop big. And if he shoots the ball well, I think that raises his ceiling. But I don't think that'll ever be something he's excellent at. Yeah, I agree. I, I see him as a piece, not a franchise player, obviously. So, like, he's somebody that, you know, everything goes right and he hits his, he hits his ceiling and he's surrounded by, like, other good players. He's, like, a third or fourth best player. And But I will say, which is very encouraging, that, you know, the, the tape of him defending Ron Holland in the, that League Ignite game, like, is it's embedded in my head. And like that's the kind of defense that you need in the playoffs. So if we're if we're making a tie-in, like you want a switchable five who can defend on the perimeter, at least at some point. Now he doesn't have to be a full time, but like for example, the play that Derek Lively made, who was he guard? Anthony Edwards. Like that was just enough. And in my mind, Sar should be a better perimeter defender than Lively. But uh I just have concerns like where he's at. So it's almost like if he falls to number two, not saying that's where you have him, but if he goes number two to Washington and they're just constantly in rebuild mode, is he going to like reach that ceiling? And that's not necessarily his fault, but that's just kind of the way that the NBA is. Like sometimes a good player could be buried on a team that's taking a long time to develop. And as you can see, sometimes those guys get free, like PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford. You get to see like what they actually bring to like, the table as far as like playing winning basketball. Um, but I, I like Sar. I have him number one. Uh, if Atlanta does take him number one, I think that's a very, very athletic front court with him and Jalen Johnson. And if they do keep Trey Young, like they should be able to fly up and down the court and very, very switchable. Cause I yeah. think. Let, let me ask you one question here. Uh, these are actually, I'll, I'll make it two questions. These are unrelated, but I think useful for, for listeners. If Alex Sar did not play in that Perth versus G league game, how high do you think he would be? Because I think most people, most evaluators moved him pretty much as uh, quickly to one. Like the ascension was rapid and he stuck there. And the rest of the year's film has been a little spotty. Like, I, I think that's a fair assessment. I think based on who I've spoken to, most people would agree with that. But he was dominant in that game. And then the second question is, if you were to compare Sar and Lively, I know they're very different players, but they both were heralded like high school uh, level players. Mm-hmm. Um how if if Sar were in last year's class, what pick would he go, and would it be ahead of Lively? I guess the way I'll phrase it. That's a good question. I think they would go around the same range. Uh, for part one, I think that G League game is like they. It was intentional that he played as much as he played. They featured him. That's how you get the next group of next stars to Australia. So that was intentional. But he like he definitely answered the call. But you can also sit here and say, uh, not that they're the same, but Scoot had that same situation last year where he played really well against uh, Wimbiyama, and people kind of like that was their impression of him. And for whatever reason, he didn't play as well for the rest of the season. And it's kind of like you you saw, you saw the highs of the highs in that particular game and thought that that's what you were going to get. And, you know, it's not he's not a finished product, but like Scoot has struggled. So with Sar, I feel like if you take away that game, does he? Is, are we talking about him as the second best player or the best player? Probably not, because like you said, the, the film in Australia was just like, eh, it was all right. But again, in, in comparison to Lively, Lively didn't have the best. He didn't have the production. Yeah. That was the the Mavericks scouting was like, look, we see what he can do. We're gonna ignore the production. We're gonna like we see the talent. And I mean, with Luca, we know for worst case scenario, dunk the ball, rebound. So it'd be interesting to see. Uh, it would have been interesting to see what Lively looked like in a different situation. But again, with that Luca stimulus package, your job is extremely easy, and he can pass the ball. So um, I think that Sar, to make a long story less long, I think he's going to be fine. But I, I, he's a three and a half level according to Leaf, and I agree with you. Like, he's going to be a good rotation guy, and his ceiling, I don't foresee, you know, turnaround jumper. Like, I don't know if that's going to be consistently his game. Like, he has showed flashes of. Yeah, I think those flashes were enticing enough for 
for many evaluators, including myself, for a long time. And I think rightfully so in some cases. And in other cases, it may be a little fool's gold. Like he showed off jump hooks, kind of rip throughs, get to the rim, finish adeptly with, I wouldn't say really either hand, but, you know, he dunked the ball on the left Mm -hmm. side and he was able to get to the right and kind of use the glass as his friend. So he showed more skill than he showed the rest of the season in that game. And then, of course, he showed the defensive package, like you mentioned, against Ron Holland. Well, coming up next, we're going to talk about Ron Holland, who's moved in my big board, along with a few others who have uh, risen. So but before we do that, uh, let me tell you guys about eBay Motors. Uh, Passion, drive, patience. The formula for winning a championship is also keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. And whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need and the and the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items apply. Exclude, uh, sorry, eligible items only. Ex- exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Welcome back to Locked on NBA Big Board. I'm Leif Tulene along with James Barlow. But we have one more question for you. Are you guys watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV day, all day long? Well, you have to turn down the volume with all that shouting. Well, then make the switch today to Locked on Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked on Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of, your locked on, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day all righty james so i made the uh, the point that holland moved for me i i've said that i think he's got a lot of all-star potential like if anyone's going to do it in this class which is not a given obviously likelihood is that one of the 58 players drafted will be an all-star and i'm not ignorant to that but it doesn't look super obvious i made the point that holland could be one of them but i've dropped him a little bit in favor of stefan castle what do you make of that change and I know you've been high on Castle. I, I actually listed your logic and maybe another person's that I spoke to in my previous episode when I broke down the top 10 where you likened him to Jimmy Butler. And I, w- I didn't go that far, and I know that wasn't your intention of saying it's a straight comparison, but what, what do you make of that change? Because I know you're also high on Holland. So uh, if I feel like if Castle can't shoot, he's going to be able to still defend at a high level, still make plays, and I still think that off the dribble, he's going to be able to score. He has, he does have a good touch in the paint. He, he gets floaters off. So I'm, I'm buying him being able to shoot. And ultimately, like, if we sit here and list the things that they, the, the two of the guys do better or compare their talents and their skills, I feel like they are almost even. I mean, Ron is the better athlete, the better first step, but also – uh, Castle has the better pace. So, like, I when it comes to like those, I rather have pace than be a great athlete. Because again, you can you can sneaky be sneaky with your pace and get to your spots. And sometimes an athlete can just only move at one speed. Uh, but I feel like, from my standpoint, I just like Castle better. Again, when I say he reminds me of Jimmy Butler, who who knows if we'll ever see him? Jimmy Butler, a guy that went late in the first round, turned himself into a playoff monster. But I look at a guy where Jimmy Butler moves at his own pace. He gets to his spots. Uh, I know Castles, if it's a, true or not, he doesn't want to play for a team that already has a point guard. Well, I look at Jimmy Butler when he's Jimmy Butler in Miami, who's the primary ball handler? It's him. So I don't really get caught up in the semantics of who's a point guard or whatever. I feel like Castle is a playmaker and I've had him, uh earlier i had ron a little higher but i'm i'm really sold on castle in the top three or four and i just feel like he if you how you feel about ron's all-star potential i feel like castle has that as well so but let me ask you a question as far as uh him saying if it's true or not yeah i don't know if that's some twitter stuff but him saying i only want to work out for teams who don't have point guards how do you feel about that I actually think that helps his potential uh, mm-hmm. because the way I view it is you mentioned how athletic Holland is and how he's a better athlete than Castle. And I agree with you, 
but I don't think he's at a position where he's positionally more athletic compared to the rest of the league. Because if Castle's playing point guard, he's closer to the like the upper upper echelon of athletic ability in terms of being a point guard because he's an athlete at six foot six. Whereas you could go to some of the lickety split quick point guards and they're slender and smaller. Mm-hmm. And so if you get a functional and pretty athletic, like if he's 75th percentile in twitchiness, which I think is probably fair, he's he's 95th in size. And that that's a better combination than someone who's probably 95th in speed and 40th in size. And I think that's kind of what Holland becomes if he plays the three. Now, if he's a two, I think you're a little closer to the middle in, in, in those percentiles that I gave. But I think one thing that, that I've recently been trying to think about is not necessarily floor or ceiling or immediate impact versus long-term impact. Like I said, Holland's a guy that I think could be an all-star if everything works out. But it's the versatility of roles, the likelihood for success, depending where they play, whether it's a different team, whether it's a different position. And I see more avenues to success for Castle the more I think about it than I do for Holland. And But I still would say Holland's top end outcome may be higher than Castle's. But I see Castle having more avenues to success, even if it's not like Jimmy Butler. I can see a way where he's one of the better defenders on your roster and is able to get you 15 points a game on good efficiency and take out a leading guard. And, and and I mean that by defensively. And so Holland to me, I think would have to be off the ball entirely. And if he doesn't pan out as a shooter and he's like, like you said, he's a straight line driver. That's one of my knocks on him. He doesn't really mm-hmm. have much wiggle to him or guile near the rim. He's just a straight line driver, hang in the air, try to contort his body or draw contact. Castle's got a little more intermediary game. He's got a little more wiggle, even if he's not as quick. And so uh, I'm, starting to see the vision on castle even more so. And I, I don't know if it's Jimmy Butler, but I, uh, the reason that I bring that up is Jimmy Butler early in his career. And that was while I was young, um, he was a known as a defensive player that was good in the mid range. And he obviously mm-hmm. is still that, but he's taken it to a different level. If castle can be what young Jimmy Butler was in this glass, that's, that's pretty good. Whereas Holland to me, I think, I mentioned Josh Okogie as someone I could see him being pretty easily. Hundred percent, see that too. And, and it, like he could be better than that for sure. I'm not saying that's that's exactly what he's going to be, but I think that outcome is likely enough to where I can't be as optimistic as I was. But I still have him fourth, so that's my three and four right there: Castle and then Holland. Okay, let me ask you about this latest, and it, it's almost like this is it's an advantage for him. Zachary Reese is still playing basketball, so he's still putting out good film. You have him at number five. Yeah. Has he, his recent play changed his your perception of him? I would say there's two reasons. I think his recent play hasn't influenced me that positively, but it hasn't hurt him. Mm-hmm. And and so that's almost the bigger thing. But the biggest thing is I was at the combine. A lot of the wings that I valued in terms of their upside more than I valued Reese floor a.k.a. Cody Williams, Matos Buzelis, guys that I previously had around these spots, I was pretty disappointed in what I saw from what I thought is their biggest swing skill in, in shooting. And if their shooting doesn't pan out, what do they end up being? I think Williams is more raw than people are willing to say in the sense that that he, I like him, and I've had him high throughout much of the year, but like he might be better defensively than offensively at the start of his career. And that's scary considering he's kind of reliant on guile offensively. So that means he's probably not that superb of an athlete despite length. And then Buzelis, I want him to have the ball because he is big and he's coordinated, but he's not very good with the ball. Like he doesn't move me in terms of his dribble moves or or like the skill package that many people tout him to have. And then his shot was really concerning. Williams is, I think you can find a way, like he shot 42% and I know it was low volume. And I've said a million times, I'm a volume guy. Like if you shoot a lot, that means there's confidence there. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he's that good of a shooter. And it came off a little knuckleball-y, but at least 42% means something. Buzelis is a track record of three of the last four years. He's been a bad shooter, even in high school. And so if you're a bad shooter and you don't really dribble that well, I don't really care if you're 6'11", because that makes you play the three or the four more than the two, which is what he's kind of like. That's the plus side. So to answer your question, I I agree. I I think I would say he's a three right now, but depends the team he goes to. I think he might be better suited as a four and you just go for a skillful four and hope he's Lamar Odom more than you get like 
Uh, I, I don't know exactly what I'm seeing for a two. Like maybe Gordon Hayward is someone that he would be compared to. But I, I just don't see it as much. So to answer your question about Reese though, I think the fact he's playing well in the games doesn't necessarily move him up. But the fact he's not hurting his stock while others actively did, um, mm -hmm. th and it was just up close and personal. Like sometimes when you see something in person, it, it means more. And that was one of those things for those two wings. And and I think Reese has shown more athleticism in these games than than uh, I previously had seen. Like he's showing the ability to to take that next step and he's growing more assertive. And so mm -hmm. that does move him a little bit, but I wouldn't say it's like a overreaction to the 21 points that, that I think at some points were more um, emphatic than others. Like some, some of those were actual, like, Hey, that was a really good basketball play. And other ones were just look at him. He ran out and got a dunk and that's. Yeah. And you know, I agree with you. Uh, I had him at 10. That's too low. Uh, I don't think he gets past Detroit. I still couldn't take him one or even two just because I still think he doesn't show much as much off the dribble as I would want and the playmaking is there isn't there. But like for him and for Detroit, I think that would be the best spot because yeah. he gets a playmaking point guard. He can slide in if they have a, a humongous need for what he does best. And the expectations wouldn't be like ridiculous ridiculously high on him. I don't think and I don't know the kid, obviously, but I just feel like if you take him number one, regardless of how the draft shakes out 10 years from now, 15 years from now, whatever we think about the 2013 draft, we always think Anthony Bennett, right? And it wasn't his fault he was drafted number one. It's just that's where he was drafted and it didn't work out. And I don't, you know, I don't think that taking Risa Shade number one is, because I just don't think he's going to be the best player in this draft, but I don't see him falling past Detroit. Yeah, that, that's kind of the way I'm leaning. Like I, the reason I had him eight uh, entering the combine when I, I think mm -hmm. I put it out May 8th. Today's May 27th when we're recording. I had him number eight. I moved him to five. But like I said, I think a lot of it is the people in front of him uh, moved in a negative direction more than he's moved positively. But I like his floor. And I think just those little bits of showing athleticism it, that it's functional more so than just like testing at a combine setting uh, matters a little bit. So that, that's my top five. We'll, we'll go six through 10 quickly coming up next. But first, a word from a few sponsors. All righty. Welcome back to Locked On NBA Big Board. Leaf Tulin and James Barlow here. We had a really nice discussion about some of the wings that I've had ranked three through five. Well, coming up, number six is Donovan Klingon. Donovan Klingon, to me, is a guy that I don't think has that high of a potential. But in this type of draft, we talked about drafting pieces. I think he's the guy with the most projectable role of anyone in the class. And so that's why I have him pretty at a, at a safe spot at number six. Yeah. Uh, I like that at number six. I don't like these rumors about him going to Houston though. I, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Uh, I don't like that. Fit I feel, with, with, I feel uh, like if you, fella. if you don't feel like you can close with Shane Goon, just close with Jabari Smith. Yeah. Right. You're not going to, you're going to have issues with Jokic regardless who you put out there. And I don't think Klingon is the answer. Uh, if you, if you even make it to the playoffs, right. If you somehow draw Dallas in the playoffs, you can't throw Klingon out there. He's going to be food. I'm sorry. Uh, so it's, I, I like him in Memphis. I have him going number nine. I understand exactly what he's, he's like Reese Shea for a big, I know exactly what I'm going to get from him. Uh, I just, he, he's, um he can pass, but, He's just not good on offense either. And it's not, I'm sorry, as a for as a jazz fan enthusiast, he's not uh Rudy Gobert bad around the rim, but he just doesn't have like vertical pop in traffic at all. And so when he does get offensive rebounds, I see him getting a shot block a lot. Uh, it's just gonna have to be like a lot of lobs. And depending on the situation, I mean, if he doesn't have that kind of point guard, it may be kind of tough. So, like, when I looked at in the previous drafts, like Mark Williams, Walker Kessler, uh, like those those fives that are like your, your rim runners and your dunkers, he's just probably the poorest athlete of them. But I understand what he is. Like, he's going to be big. He's going to fizzle. He's still going to block shots. And I think he's a pretty good passer, too. But um, I just can't get down with him at two yeah, or even three. I think that's kind of crazy. I, I agree. Really I agree, and I honestly – I had him lower as well. And like I said, Cody Williams, Matos Buzelis, a few other guys dropping is why he moved up. Uh, I do think he's a little more polished than Walker Kessler. I think Kessler and Williams are better athletes, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, I do think 
Klingon's got softer touch around the rim than um, those two guys. I think Lively's uh, like a better athlete. But if you look at what matters in the NBA right now, it, it's especially if it were Memphis, um, the, the teams that would like him would play him in a way that's conducive to success. He knows all he has to do is get vertical, a la Roy Hibbert, put his arms up, mm -hmm. defend the rim, and then when he catches the ball near the hoop, try to dunk it. And his free throw form looked pretty good at the combine, so that like helps him a little bit. But I, I don't know. I don't feel like he's that great, but he's just projectable. Yeah. And then and then we get to the interesting part, uh, seven through ten. I'll, I'll rattle them off and take it wherever you want. Uh, I, I've got I've got a couple guys that I've moved a lot. Nikola Topic is someone I had in my top four for much of the year. He's seventh. Uh, Tijon Salon is eighth. He's a big riser. Number nine, number ten, Dalton connects. So take that where you want. We can we can hash it out for a few minutes. All right, real quick. Why did Topic drop? Well, Topic dropped for me because I watched some more film, and I decided that I liked for much of the year that he was not tricky with the ball. Like he got to his spots without being tricky, and then I decided, you know what? I don't know if if his shot, which is very very flat. Mm -hmm. um, is going to go in enough to command the respect in order to get to the rim, which is what he did so well as an 89th percentile pick and roll guy. He's excellent in pick and roll, but if his shot doesn't go in very much, teams can go under and that doesn't put that much stress on the defense. And I know like you're going to, you're going to say, well, teams did that in Europe, but I think the NBA has just that much better athletes to where it puts a little bit of concern for me. And he's very reliant on one little move, which is kind of like a, between the legs at the top to set pace, then he's either going to go left kind of quickly or cross back to his right and to kind of use his body. Um, and so I just felt, I just kind of thought about the way that the NBA at the leveraged pot parts of games, like the players that aren't particularly fast that have the ball and are excellent at it, have a lot of counters. They're not very predictable and he's not the athlete to get away with speed. And he doesn't have the counters and the guile that I think you need to succeed as a, heavy ball dominant guard at the NBA level, even though he's tall. Do you see that same issue minus the shooting, obviously with Tyrese Halliburton? Like sometimes he's oh, yeah. just not tricky enough to. No, to he, yeah, yeah. He, he's, he's one of those guys that if you were to play one-on-one -on -one with Halliburton versus players that are not at the same level, you'd be like, Oh, like this guy's far better. Like there's tons of like six man archetypes that are better at scoring than Halliburton, but Halliburton's, so clever at passing and then he shoots 40 something percent from three yes. and so that's why i'm starting to draw that concern because Halliburton's not quick but he's got enough guile and touch to do some but at the end of the games he's really not very good like siakam's their closer and siakam mm -hmm. for better or worse is predictable right yeah he's spinning right he's going right and he's yeah. gonna spin left yeah yeah all right so we we've kind of spoke on reed shepherd enough and we spoke on dawn connect I want to spend this last few minutes with two questions. But first, T. John Salon is number eight right now. Why? So this is one where if I were drafting, and I and I think part of this, I'll preface is when I did podcast for the Jazz and I think about my favorite team and who's going to be available, the way I foresee the draft going is – there's going to be a lot of teams afraid to make mistakes. So guys like Connect, someone who's projectable to score the ball, shoot the ball well, someone like Klingon or Reese those guys are going to be more coveted, in my opinion, than the Ron Hollins, the Cody Williams, those type of archetypes where there's a little more boomer bust. And I think Tijon Salon has the most tools of any of the players in this draft in terms of just raw physical um, wingspan, agility, a lot of those type of things. I don't think he's as good of a basketball player yet as some of these players. But he's playing high leverage games at the end of the season. And instead of being a role player that fits in and has just like a, a hey, that's a good shooting game, like that's helpful as a three and D, he took off and, and commandeered um, what was a upset win against Paris playing for Cholet. He was the best player on the floor in that game, according to my eye. Um, and I think that if you're going to get a player, especially around eight through 12 in this draft, that's going to pan out and make, make other teams look dumb for passing on him and make you look great for getting him. Uh, I think he's the guy with those tools. Um, and, and I know that's not answering. Okay. Then why is he above some guys that are safe? I, I tend to be someone who likes upside. And so that's one of my upside swings. And I I'll believe that he's one of those guys that's going to be dependent on fit more than other players in this draft. And I fully acknowledge that's weak for saying, okay, where's he going to go? But if he, 
if he goes to a team that has the time to develop him without rushing him, I think he's better than Bilal Koulibaly was, bigger than Bilal Koulibaly was. Koulibaly went seventh um, uh, in a better draft. And so I, I think if you follow that same rationale, he's going to go in the top eight. And I think of a team like the Spurs, obviously the connections with Wembenyama, French, you know, or even my jazz. I really think there's a lot of upside and it's can't miss potential in a draft that's lacking top end upside. Okay. And we talked about uh, actually these two before. So, and you know, this is why I like you, Leaf. You, you are Leaf. You're not Leaf reading somebody else's stuff. You're like, this is what I see and this is what I'm going to stick with. No Cody Williams. No minus Pazellas. Briefly explain. Yeah, so so they are 11 and 12. So for those of you panicking enormously, like they're not too far back. But the logic really is that those two players, to hit their top end upside where you kind of think, like I said, toolsy players with boom or bust potential. And I do think there's a little more safety with Williams because I think he could play off the ball a little bit. But the reason I say this is, that they're a little more raw is okay. If he plays off the ball, he loses some of those, those tools and assets that you think are the best for Cody Williams. I'm not saying James or myself, just in terms of one would say that Cody, Cody Williams is best attributes would be being on the ball at six foot eight and having the ability to see over the defense, be a pick and roll operator who can score in multiple ways. Well, if he's off the ball because he's not great dribbling the ball, um, then you're going to see how real the shooting is. And then if his defense is what you're more ready for immediately, uh, I like I said, I don't think he's that twitchy of an athlete. I think he's a fluid, kind of coordinated, tricky scorer more than he is the twitchy one that his brother is. His brother's twitchy, kind of thicker, stronger. And I understand he was older coming out, but they're different builds. Like all brothers um, ha- share some genetics, but they're not necessarily one and the same in terms of the, the athletic um, makings. Like my brother and I, very, very different athletes. Uh, and, and I'm sure in, at the NBA level, you can even see – more of those things personified because Jalen Williams is, I would say, a 90th percentile NBA athlete, if not higher. I think Cody's more in the 65th to 70th. Mm-hmm. And, and he may be a better shooter immediately at a younger age, but Jalen's a really good shooter. So I think a lot of what he gets upside from is that Jalen could be a plus size point guard and was that at Santa Clara. And there's a lot of projection there. It's conjecture. As for Buzelis, like I said, I don't think he has any wiggle with the ball. And if you're 6'11", you kind of have to have some sort of wiggle if you're going to be that slide of frame to play the three. And then if you're going to play the four, it's even more of a glaring issue, especially if you're not shooting the ball to space. So um, Buzelis, I'm more out on than Williams. I think Williams has a chance to re-enter these rankings if I if I kind of think about something different. I, I yeah. tend to base it on, hey, I'm watching the playoffs. What type of player wins basketball games? What's mm-hmm. the, what type of player can I project to have this archetype, not just for one team that's specific to fit, but any team, and I can envision their versatility mattering. Williams has ways that it can happen, but in, in my latest musings, he's he's fallen, especially because he didn't shoot well at the combine. Yeah, uh, I I had Cody like outside of the lottery. Um, I'm just I'm struggling to see what is going to translate. Like, I know he's tall. I don't know if he's a I think he's a ball mover, not a playmaker. Um, He's like he's straight line, but he's not the Ron Holland athlete straight line. And he's not the dog Ron Holland is on offense either. So, like, I I think he is your prototypical three and D guy. And I've mentioned before, I'm not really a big fan of the three and D guy. Uh, that three and D mode, I understand it, and I'm not talking about you know like if you sit here and say PJ Washington is a three and D guy, but there were plays the other night where PJ beat his man off the dribble at the top of the key, and he made plays. Those are the same plays he was making in Charlotte when he had a bigger role. So again, next to those guys, the superstars, he is essentially very limited to usage. But I'm just I I'll go back and watch some more Cody. But I there are I'd take Jalen Tyson over him right now. Um, I don't, I would take, they're not the same position. I take Tyler, uh, Tyler Smith over him right now. So, but I, I see, and, you know, again, it depends on what game I watch with my eyes, you know, one game, he may look at, look like a top five pick another game. I don't know what he's doing out there. So, but very interesting leaf again, you be, you march to the beat of your own drum. And I really appreciate that because I do too. So. Final thoughts. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I try to I try to give an unbiased assessment of, of what I think wins basketball games and which players have the most potential. So I appreciate that. And 
I like I like having these conversations where we talk about different philosophies. And I think another one we should do coming up, maybe even tomorrow for the everydayers to look forward to, is what's the difference between a three and D and who who exemplifies that in this draft versus players with role versatility that are small forwards, aka the three position. So look forward to that. I like uh, that one. Yeah, yeah I, I that thought one. of that on the spot. So that, that'll be James and I. <laughs> that'll be us tomorrow. So tune into that one. But we have one more request for you guys. So Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV, free in the Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today has uh, has you covered. It's here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today, now available on the free Fire TV channels app. And that'll do it from James and I. We appreciate you guys listening. And stay tuned for tomorrow's episode we just teased.